recording. And we should be live. Welcome back to the Money Advantage podcast. I'm Rachel Marshall, and I have my co host Bruce Weiner with me today, as well as special guest. And I am going to try to say your name correctly, and hopefully, we'll do an amazing job. Ruchi Koval. We, we didn't discuss your last name. Is Koval the correct pronunciation? Uh, Koval, as in Valley. Koval. Koval. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Ruchi Koval. Very good. Uh, all right. We'll try to keep that the for the rest of the show. So thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today, Rohi. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm honored. Well, wonderful. Well, if you are coming to this conversation, you might be saying, why should I listen? What does this have to do with me and my life specifically? So today we're talking about the keys to success and probably from a different angle than you have heard of before. Most of the time, if you're on this show and you're a regular listener, you are looking to up-level in your financial life. You're looking for more financial control. You're looking to reach certain targets. You're looking to create financial freedom, to teach your kids financial stewardship, to be in a position of really success financially. But what I would ask you to do as we step into this conversation is to really ask yourself, what is the definition of financial success. And we're going to talk about money from a different lens today than you probably have ever heard before. So we're going to talk about what is hidden in the ancient Jewish practice or timeless Jewish practice of Musar. Now, am I pronouncing that word correctly? You are. Um, you are in, you know, according to technical grammatical Hebrew, it is called Musar. It has come colloquially to be known as Musar. So either one of those pronunciations is in use. I am not quite sure if I heard the difference, but I will attempt Musar to pronounce Musar or Musar. It depends oh, on which syllable okay. you put the accent on, but both of them are definitely usable. Just worry about how you say my name. Don't worry about anything else. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and dig in. First, Rohit, can you um, share with us? Well, actually, first, Bruce, before we dive into that piece of the conversation, um, I would like to share that Rohit is a motivational speaker, a coach. She's the author of a book called Soul Construction, which we'll dig into a little bit later in the conversation today. And if you're really in a position of wanting to become financially successful, I would really ask you to listen in, tune in, and be prepared for a conversation conversation that's going to challenge you and help you grow and develop a correct and right relationship with money. So Bruce, what would you love to share as we jump into this conversation first? Well, I think what, as we discuss this, th these types of, to of topics with the listeners is that they cannot really enjoy uh, success both in a monetary way and in an emotional way unless they really understand what that success means to you. And so uh, I believe in today's conversation, we're going to help maybe set some guidelines for people that they can then um, adjust to their emotional way of thinking about success. Mm, that's good. All right. So let me share a little bit more about Rookie before we dive in. And so if you are coming to this show, you may say, let me understand who is this conversation coming from. So Rookie Koval. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is the co-founder and associate director of Congregation JFX, an innovative community in Cleveland, Ohio. She has been a Jewish educator for two decades, leading self-development groups for adults and teens and mentoring educators around the world. Rohi is a certified parenting coach, motivational speaker, musician, author, and mother. She is a trip leader for Momentum, inspiring hundreds of women on their journeys in Israel. She is also a colonist, columnist, for the Jewish, the Cleveland Jewish News, and the author of two books, Conversations with God and Soul Construction. Construction, man, that's hard to pronounce. Find Rohi on Facebook and Instagram and on her blog at outoftheorthobox.com. We'll say these again at the end. She also has a podcast on iTunes and Spotify, and you can find many of her lectures online. So I'm very excited to dig into this conversation. Rohi, can you tell us just a little bit about your background and how you came to really studying and practicing and teaching Musar? Yeah, absolutely. So I was raised right here in Cleveland, Ohio, and I went to a Jewish day school. I was raised uh, Orthodox Jewish, as was my husband. That's how we are raising our family as well. Um, and so I went to an Orthodox Jewish day school for 12 years straight through. 
Um, and the school that I went to here in Cleveland, it's called the Hebrew Academy of Cleveland. It's actually founded by the inheritors of the Musser movement, mm. which I'll tell you what that means in a moment. But that means that I was basically raised on the precepts of Musser from the time I was little enough to speak. Um, so Musser is a concept of ethical character development. This idea, you know, throughout throughout the generations, people of faith have been asking themselves, how can we make faith relevant to the next generation? One of the answers that came forth in the 1800s was this concept of Musser, which had been in existence, but kind of latent, that a primary path to spirituality could be focusing on our character traits. Mm -hmm. Meaning some had said that it was very much academic, that it focused primarily on studying the texts. And then the Hasidic movement came along, for instance, and said, well, it's prim primarily about emotion, about joy and passion and song. And then the Muslim movement came around and said, well, maybe it's about character traits, that you can't have academics and joy without working on to make sure that you are a spiritually and, you know, relationshiply evolved human being. So there's one rabbi in particular, his name was Rabbi Israel Salanter, and he revived Musser, and that what came, what came to be known as the Musser movement. So the rabbi who founded my school, his name was Rabbi Dessler, his father was one of the main Musser masters of the previous generation. So I was raised on this concept of focusing on your character traits, kindness, joy, patience, humility, um, and like working on anger and letting other people have their way. You know, that that was as Jewish as charity and traveling to Israel and, you know, observing the Sabbath. So this is the cradle in which I was raised. Um, when my husband and I got married, we were extremely young. I was 19, he was 22. So we didn't really know what we wanted to do when we grew up because we hadn't grown up yet. <laughs> um, we lived in Israel for the first five years of our marriage. Our first three kids were born there and somewhere along the way, which is part of the foreword in my book, it's a cute little story, um, he decided to become a rabbi. Um, I didn't know that I was necessarily interested in being a rabbi's wife, so I sort of resisted that for a while, <laughs> but eventually I came around, which in Yiddish is called a rabbitzin. That's what I talk about in my foreword. Mm -hmm. um, but at some point along the way, I obviously embraced that role because that's what I do today, and primarily what I teach is Musser. And I, I teach all the texts through Musser, the Bible, the stories of the prophets, the book of Psalms, everything comes through the lens of what are, what are, let's tease out the character traits. So even when we have a conversation about money, you know, and we could say, well, what does money have to do with that? Well, the answer is everything has to do with that because we bring our character traits to everything that we do. I love that you asked the question, what does money have to do with that? Because that is the question that probably everyone who is listening or who is approaching this from not inside the Jewish faith may mm -hmm. be asking, what does money have to do with ethical character development? And I guess we could take a long shot and say, well, you should probably be a good person to use money well, you know, and I, we could go down that track for a while. But can you share from your perspective, what does money have to do with really focusing on character development? And I guess more importantly, why should we focus on character development, even if we're not in the Jewish faith, even for somebody who is saying, well, does this help me accomplish my financial goals better? Um, and, and how how do we answer that question? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I believe that ancient Jewish wisdom is universal. That means that it can apply to anyone. That's why this book, the, this book that I wrote, Soul Construction, is not just targeted for Jews. It's targeted for anybody because I do believe that it's universal wisdom. The point of Musser is really self-transformation, but it definitely affects everybody around us without a doubt. So just to give you an example, you know, a Dale Carnegie's classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? Many of the tools in that book are very much in line with Musser. It's about how to make other people feel good, how to make other people feel seen and heard and respected, right? However, that book is goal-oriented. Some might even say agenda-oriented right? Which is to, ha Dale Carnegie was a salesman and he was te teaching people how to make the best sales. I actually taught that book once to a Musser group and we teased mm -hmm. out all the Musser lessons. The only difference is that Musser's agenda is about self-transformation. 
but the tools all lead you to the same road. And that's why I think that this wisdom is universal. So I'm just going to throw out an example to you, right? Um, one of the things that comes up in the Musser school of thought regarding money is the issue of greed, right? And how much money does a person need? Part of, part of Musser is this concept, and this, the uh, medieval scholar Maimonides talks about this, that character traits, we should aim to have our character traits be in balance. So that means anything to an extreme is unhealthy, right? So for instance, even generosity, right? We are taught in the Bible to tithe, to give part of our money to charity. Okay, well, there's something called reverse tithing, where you give 90% of your money away and you keep 10% for, 10 for yourself. Mm -hmm. Judaism doesn't recommend that. Judaism says, no, that's too extreme. We want you to keep your money. We want you to make money. We want you to do good things with money, right? But let's not be extreme. Don't hoard all of it for yourself. Don't be an ascetic and give it all away. So by the same token, greed, a person should have ambition. A person should have drive. There's a reason that God put that desire within us because we can accomplish so much good with it. But when that becomes extremist and radicalized, that's where it turns into greed. And so it's, it's important to understand attitudes towards money, even through the lens of Musser, which is that the desire to make money is not inherently good or bad. It's actually neutral. The mm -hmm. question is, what is your attitude? What is your goal? What do you plan to do with it? How do you plan to make that money? Right? The character trait of honesty comes into play here. The character trait of generosity comes into play here. The character trait of honor seeking, glory seeking comes into play here. So there's so many different character traits that will play into the question of making money. And I think awareness, you know, if somebody were to listen to this podcast and say, wow, I never even thought about that. How, how many of my character traits are impacted? And if I can get my character traits in balance, then my pursuit of money could be something that is fulfilling for me and for my family and will create harmony and not discord. I love you know, that you go ahead, Bruce. Well, I, as you were speaking, I was just thinking if, if you understand that the people only get paid well, when they're doing a service or are producing a good that people actually want. So then it's almost impossible to be, too greedy and actually get what you want on a long sustainable time or or it's impossible to be too dishonest or i'm not sorry it's, it's possible it's impossible to be too honest uh because uh the honesty is actually what people are gravitating to when you're giving them a good goods and service so people always are pointing to these like greedy cases or people making money from dishonesty but they're only People are only can do that for a short period of time and they eventually get caught and they eventually then pay the, the piper. <laughs> so if, if, if people understand that these are long-term traits that are good and that's what uh, the, the invisible hand of the economy actually wants in, as far as goods and services done by good people and unhonorable people. Yeah, so what you're saying you're basically, I don't know if you know this, you're basically quoting King Solomon. So, <laughs> um, no, I don't know. Well, I, think, one of, I, I like King Solomon, but I didn't know I was quoting him. Okay. So one of the classic muster texts that I teach on Thursdays is the book of Proverbs. And that was written by King Solomon thousands of years ago. And he talks a lot about money. And he was actually one of the wealthiest men who ever lived. Absolutely. So, was. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's got a lot to say on the topic and he he can say it because he's not one of these guys who always wants it. He has it. And he he's, you know, well qualified to speak. So one of the things he talks about over and over again is when people get disheartened because they see that dishonest people are making it and honest people are losing out. Right. And they're like, well, why do all the good guys finish last? And King Solomon consistently counsels patience and wisdom. Sorry, patience um, and faith which are two very important character traits. So basically, stay, keep your head down, stay humble, stay patient, stay the course, and have faith in God. Exactly what you're saying, they're going to have to pay the piper eventually. Don't be distracted by that. That's a red herring. That's so, so valuable and so true. And I think that's part of the reason why it's so important and valuable to focus then on your character and on being that good person who can 
legitimately see the needs of others, provide them with value, have good relationships because then money is the result of that value exchange that happens between people, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and another way that I think character traits very much come into play when it comes to money, um, and this is the last chapter in my book, Soul Construction, is my chapter on happiness. Um, and this is also another theme that recurs in Musser, which is, you know, who is happy, one who is satisfied with what he has. That if a person is conscientious and responsible about making money, but is then irresponsible about spending it, because, you know, they get so distracted by all the things they want or all the things other people have or all the noisy advertisements that are going on around us, then it doesn't matter how much money you have because the culturalism and materialism can rob them of their happiness, even if they have the resources. So this is kind of like on the other end, once you've made your money, now what do you do with it? That also has a whole pattern and, you know, kind of spider's web of character traits that play into that aspect of it. Well, let's talk about those more for a moment because there's something really interesting that you're talking about here. It's not an amount of money that satisfies. We all think it's more, right? It's right. somehow more than what I currently have. And why do we think that? Because, well, if I have the more, then I can use the more to get the thing that I really want. But that is this never ending it's like a tunnel. We, we travel down that tunnel and then you realize that, well, I have more I uh, money and I have more things and that still didn't fill that void. And right. I think that can cause people to go in this really negative direction of thinking, well, those that have made the most money sometimes realize, well, that did not fulfill and did not satisfy. And they realize the relationship with money is wrong. So how do you, how do you write that? Okay. So two thoughts come to mind. The first <clears throat> is uh, there is another classic muster text, it's called Ethics of the Fathers, which I quote numerous times in my book. One of the quotes in that book is, the more possessions, the more worry. So a person doesn't realize, like, if you have one house, then you only have to worry about one house. If you have two houses, then you have to worry about two houses. And if you have two houses and a boat, you know, you see where I'm going with this, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not the things mm -hmm. that, that will bring you happiness. So ancient Jewish wisdom actually teaches that money doesn't define you money doesn't define you at all how much you have of it doesn't define you at all what and actually you know judaism very much recognizes wealth as a blessing from god right because um although we definitely see that there is a relationship between effort and reward right if i try hard i work hard i'm innovative i'm conscientious you know then with god's blessings i will earn money you know, but some people earn more than others, even with a similar amount of effort. So we recognize that, you know, wealth is a blessing. So it's not what you earn that defines you, but your attitude towards what you earn mm. and what you do with what you earn. That is what defines you because you can only be defined by your choices. You cannot be defined by what happens to you. So you can have people who are extremely wealthy and are humble and kind and generous and relatable and approachable, you know, and then you can have people who earn a little bit of money and all of a sudden they're arrogant and snobbish and stuck up and nobody can get near them, right? So it's not about what you have. It's about how you define what you have, how you use what you have um, and your attitude towards what you have. Is, is your attitude, wow, I'm, I'm so blessed, I'm so grateful, you know, or is your attitude was, whoo go me, I'm the best. You know, that's so valuable because that plays into another piece of the conversation that we haven't even brought up here on this on this podcast with you. But a lot of times people have this negative view of leaving an inheritance to children, mm -hmm. partially because they think, well, I've been successful. I created this wealth. I earned it from nothing. And now that my children can have this lifestyle, I am able to leave an inheritance to them. But what if that corrupts them somehow? What if it makes them make choices that they're spending on things that are not part of my value system? Or what if they use it for self-destructive lifestyle? What if they that turns into family feuding and all of the challenges that come from money in the hands of somebody who doesn't have good character? And I think what can happen is that the misguided problem people think the money giving the money is a problem that's not the problem the problem is the character of the children has not been focused on it and attended to and developed and if that one piece was improved then you would have money amplify or magnify 
whatever the character was of that person. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah. You know, one of the things that's interesting that I'll just say as an introduction to my response, one of the things King Solomon does in his books is he uses money as a metaphor. And now the metaphor on the simple read is also true. So I'll just give you an example. He says that you should, you should seek wisdom like gold and silver. So what that means is that a person will seek gold and silver. In order for the metaphor to be true, we are accepting the, the fact that human beings will pursue money. That's how we're wired. That's how we are, right? So again, nothing wrong with that. It all depends on how you do it, how you define yourself while you do it, and what you do with it once you get it. But it's also serving as a metaphor, which is that if you lost a diamond ring in a haystack, right, and you would literally leave no hay unturned until you found it, right, well, would you also seek wisdom that way? Because some people seek wisdom half-heartedly, like, oh, is it there? Eh, I don't know. I listened for five minutes and then I got bored, so then I turned it off. If you knew there was a diamond in there, you would keep going until the end, right? So we know that there's this inherent, and I don't want to use the word greed because greed is negative, but there's this inherent desire to accumulate wealth that is built into the nature of most every human being, right? And, and that's not a bad thing. That's how God created us. God created us ambitious because ambition, you know, breeds creativity, breeds excellence all these things are we are here in this world in this world to do good and to do good things and if we didn't have ambition you know that would be a very unpleasant place to live you know and we see increasingly there are a lot of people who don't seem to have that ambition that's not a healthy state mm -hmm. that's not a healthy state of being at all so in terms of leaving you know an inheritance to people um i mean one of the things that we're supposed to do as king solomon is saying in his metaphor is the same way that we are pursuing wealth throughout our life to try to leave our children what we can we're also we should also be pursuing wisdom and trying to leave them with that so to yes. leave them with spiritual wealth that they can take with them for the rest of their lives um, but i do think that parents should be cognizant of the fact that very often wealth can corrupt people who haven't developed their character traits to a sufficient degree and even if we've done the best parenting we can you know, some kids just turn out with a more developed sense of character and some kids turn out with a less developed sense of character. And there's really, you know, there's no exact recipe for that. So I think that sometimes the way parents leave their kids an inheritance, it's almost like asking for a family feud. You know, when there's overt favoritism, we know in the Bible, Jacob showed overt favoritism to Joseph and that mm -hmm. caused tremendous upheaval and he was taken to task for that. Um, so parents have to be careful not to do that. Parents have to be careful not to be ambiguous in their will in a way that leaves room for fighting. You know, the more clear a parent can be, the sooner they can write that will, the sooner they can communicate to their kids exactly what they want, you know, and talk things out while they're alive. You know, nobody wants to talk about death, but the sooner it's done, the better. Then the more these kinds of ugly chaos can be hopefully avoided so that the, the biggest gift that you work for your whole life to give to the next generation, you know, it, it, the most important thing we want to give to the next generation is values. And that can all be undone because of a messy will, you know, and then people don't talk to each other. I mean, we, we see this in clergy. People are estranged from one another. And it's, the more money there is, the more is the risk of estrangement and feuding. So fascinating. There's just so much to talk about here. Um, can you go back to the idea? Well, in a second, I want to go back to the idea that the money that you have doesn't define you. It's how you use it. Um, but before that, how does Musar deal with developing character in yourself? And how does it deal with developing character in your children? I realize that you can only focus on yourself, but how do you then as a parent impart those virtues and teach in a way that is helpful? I mean, obviously you're going to have to do it for yourself first and model by your behavior, but how do you think about Musar in terms of teaching children? Okay. So it's a great question. Um, one of the chapters that I talk about here in my book is the chapter on speech. It's chapter five. And one of the subjects that comes up in the power of speech is criticism and critiques. And ironically, the word Musar, technically, like literally translated from Hebrew, means ethical instruction. 
And one of the first verses in the book of Proverbs, which I keep mentioning because it's such a classic Muster text, uh, I'll, I'll quote it to you first in Hebrew and then I'll translate it in English. Shema b'ni Musar avicha. Listen, my son, to the Musar, to the ethical instruction of your father. Va'al titosh Torah imecha, and do not abandon the Torah, the Bible of your mother. So what, what this verse is really describing is that it is the parental role, both parents, where at all possible, who are giving their children a combination of the knowledge that exists in the Bible, the wisdom, with the ethical instruction that goes along with it. Meaning, this is what you should do, this is how you should do it. Those are the two things that go hand in hand. And so we have a responsibility as parents to talk about character traits from the time the kids are little. And as you're saying, definitely to role model it, but also to talk about how we're role modeling it. So for instance, if I'm giving 10% of my income to charity, right? Well, if I don't tell my kids that I'm doing that, how will they ever know that I'm doing that? Mm -hmm. You know, so I'll talk to them about the fact that when I get my paycheck in my account, 10% of it gets transferred to another account. And that's my charity account. And then, you know, my husband and I decide how are we going to allocate our charity dollars. And, and therefore, when my daughter goes babysitting and she makes, you know, 30 bucks or whatever, three of those dollars are going to charity. You know, my, our youngest, of, we have seven kids, thank God. Our youngest is 12. And she did a little babysitting this summer. And when she earned 10 bucks and one of those dollars went to charity, you know, that, that was a big ask <laughs> of a 12 year old. Um, so it, it definitely has to be caught. You know, they say, they say values are caught, not taught. Um, but it really has to be caught and taught. Um, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. And just something I want to note on that. I think so often many things parents think are being caught that don't need to be spoken that we really do need to put words around. That's why I'm a huge proponent of writing down, speaking out, what are my val what's my value system in a family? What is the rules that we use for handling and stewarding money? And talking about those things is so much more valuable than leaving it open to interpretation. So I just wanted to highlight how much I agree with you on that point. Yeah, the, yeah. The, other, the other thing I think is uh, parents do not give their children enough credit that they are intellectually ready or emotionally ready for those types of talks either. Yeah. And yeah, you may, you may be able, you may be wrong on an occasion, but you're, I don't think you're ever going to uh, cause irreparable harm by starting a conversation like that. They just may not get it right away. And yet I hear that as an excuse all the time. Well, you know, I, I can't talk about money. They don't even know what they, they can't even add yet, you know, so on and so forth. But uh, yeah, and you know what? I wonder if one of the reasons for that is that, par well, in general, people feel very uncomfortable talking about money, not right. in general terms, but in personal terms. Mm -hmm. Like, how much do I make? What do I spend it on? How did I earn it? You know, we feel like this is a this is a taboo topic. There's something inherently embarrassing about it. Um, and so we don't talk about it. Most people don't talk about it to their kids. Most I know when I was growing up, I had no idea if my parents had money. Were they rich? Were they poor? I don't know. Sometimes we bought things. Sometimes we didn't. Like, I really didn't know, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I just feel like part of the reason I think that there's this embarrassment is because, like I said before, there's this over-identification with how much we make as though it defines us. Mm -hmm. But if, if we were really to believe it doesn't define us, what we do with it defines us. So then we would find it less uncomfortable to share with our kids, listen, this is how much we make, you know, X amount goes to charity and X amount goes to savings and X amount goes to your education, uh, X amount goes to family time together, you know, like then it could be, you know, de-stigmatized, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And then kids will ingest this attitude from a young age, there's nothing... Because also what happens because of the stigma is that young people often get into financial trouble because they can't admit that they're having trouble budgeting or that they've dug themselves into a financial hole. So they don't want to tell anybody about it. So instead they get into credit card debt because that's silent debt. You don't actually, you're not actually asking anyone for money. You're just overextending your credit cards. I think it all cycles back to this over identification with what we make as though that says some kind of statement about our being or our persona or our worth. That is so insightful. So let's unpack that. I, I did definitely want to go back to that for a minute. So if, if it's more important to focus on what I'm 
doing, what I'm hearing is that I need to focus on my actions, not the outcome, not the end result. The end result might be how much money is made or earned, but my actions leading up to that, my choice to serve people, my choice in what to do with that money are more important. So you're saying, let's not define ourselves by the amount of money or amount of income. Let's focus on our actions. What does uh, Musar say about the, uh, you you had mentioned a few things before about some of the character traits that are needed to model and have a very healthy um, relationship with how we use money. Okay, so some of the character traits that I would mention are number one, envy. I think a lot of times we see what other people have and that motivates how we spend our money. Um, which, like I said, that's a distraction. That that's a red herring. You know, what somebody else is doing or where they're going. Um, that, well, if that's not in my family's budget, or frankly, that might not even be what my family likes. You know, I remember for our tenth anniversary, my husband and I went to Los Angeles together for a few days, and uh, you know, we we decided we're going to do one touristy thing. So we went to Universal Studios. It was our one like big ticket, you know, place that we went to. Neither of us liked it at all. You know, and I realized that a big part of why I wanted to go there is because everybody's like, oh, Universal Studios, you know, everybody has to go to Universal, you know. I I don't know why I thought I was going to like it. It's not even my thing. You know what I mean? We loved going on the beach, which was frankly free. (laughs) So we get all distracted by what, you know, and so there's this envy factor. I want to do what everybody says is fun. I want to do what everybody else is doing. That might not even be what fills you with joy. So that's... That's That's powerful in itself because that requires, instead of comparison and all the external things, that requires somebody to get really clear on what they actually value. Like what is actually important to me rather than what looks good on social media or what sounds good (laughs) externally, which is so easy to focus on, right? Totally. I'll give you another perfect example. So thank God we have a large family, right? And one of the things I always had in my head was, we should go on a family vacation. So all nine of us going to the same place, liking it and liking each other. That's the goal, okay? Now, of course, you know, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. What we've come to realize is what what we enjoy about a thousand times more is taking our kids away one-on-one. They're so different. The ages range from 27 down to 12. They don't all enjoy the same thing. It's not to say we'll never go anywhere together, but we at some point decided to focus on taking the kids away one-on-one and that works out so much better for our budget, for our relationship, for having fun with that kid. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes what everybody else is doing is so destructive and distracting. So there's definitely the envy factor. Um, I think a, a big character trait, and I've mentioned this before, is faith and trust, right? A big, big aspect of ancient Jew- Jewish wisdom is that God gives us exactly what we need. Of course, that doesn't preclude effort. We're responsible to do our normative human effort to use our creativity, our talent, our, our you know, intelligence, our ambition. But that I trust that God will give us what we need and that, you know, I'll know when I need it, when I get it. And that's how I'll know, you know, and then whatever God gives me, I want, I'm going to use it as responsibly as I can. So that takes a lot of anxiety out of the equation in terms of earning money. Because, um, you know, and I've seen this happen over and over again. When I need something, it comes my way. And I, I've learned to really channel this into prayer because I am somewhat controlling when it comes to our family's finances. I've got everything on a on an app. My kids make so much fun of me every single time I open the app. <laughs> like, who just put $6 on the credit card, you know? Um, so I have to learn to sort of let go and let God, you know, and to say, okay, not exactly sure how this is going to all add up, but I'm doing my job. I'm being responsible. You know, I'm doing what I can and the rest is up to God. So definitely faith and trust is a big character trait that comes in. Uh, and I think also humility, you know, remaining humble, whether a person is earning a lot of money and it's important for them to stay humble and remember that their friends are still their friends and their relatives are still their relatives. You know, it doesn't have to change you. Or conversely, when a person is trying really hard to make money and it's not working out, you know, to remember to stay humble and say, listen, I'm only human. I'm not the God of the universe and I'm limited in my scope and I can only do what I can do. So those are just a few character traits that come into play when we're talking about you know, our attitudes towards money. That so, is really so, so humbleness, so humbleness, what I've noticed through my different careers, 
one of my first careers was I was actually as actually in education in a in a private school education, and we would do programs in the summer for economic disadvantaged children, mm. and we would bring them in, in in a program called Aim High because what a lot of people don't realize is there are pockets in the inner city where children never leave a a ten block radius. They don't even know there is something outside of that. So the idea of the of the program was to bring them outside of that radius so that they could aim higher than what they they knew about. But what I noticed was that um, you brought you would bring them out of that and you would give them anything. And once they started receiving that because they didn't have that character development that we were talking about, they suddenly lost their humility huh. uh, with what they were just given. And you would think they would be you would think that they would actually be appreciative. But right. that what happens is they're appreciative at first. And then the second year they're in the program, it gets a little less. And then the third year, it gets a little less. And by about the end of the third year or the fourth year, all of a sudden it's expected. What are you going to give me next? Fascinating. You know? And I deserve this. Because yeah. look what I've done for you. I've come into your life. And this is, and we're talking like uh, 10, 11, 12 year olds that all of a sudden express that we stopped the program because of that, because we thought we were doing more harm than good in this situation. Wow. Okay. So I want to share with you, this is a very deep Jewish idea and I wasn't going to bring this up, but you mentioned this and this really hits the nail on the head. Um, and I think this idea, Rachel also speaks to the question you asked earlier about inheritance. So there's a very deep question that the mystics ask about why did God create the world? All right. If you think about it, God was fine before we showed up. Right? Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Okay. He doesn't need us. <laughs> so what did he, what did he create the world for? The world was fine. So the mystics say that there was only one thing missing from the world. And that was a recipient for kindness mm. because God had so much of a desire to give and there was no one to receive those gifts. So God created humans. However, God did not want to create a nation of trust fund babies. For the exact reason, Bruce, that you just mentioned, because God didn't want us to become entitled and essentially unhappy. The language in the Talmud that's used for this is Nahama de Chasufa. That means bread of shame. Mm. God didn't want us to accept bread of shame, something that we had not earned. It wouldn't be good for us. It wouldn't be good for our character on so many levels. So what did God do? God created a world in which human beings would have free will. And we would have to choose good to earn good. That's what would be truly good for us. So then when God did gift us with his kindness, we would have earned it and we would feel amazing. Because there's nothing, no comparison between that check that you get as a handout and that check that you get as your first paycheck. No comparison. And God wanted us to feel amazing about that first check. So back to the inheritance, right? One of the things, Rachel, that I think parents a lot of times focus on their money in terms of what are they going to leave over to their kids, but I think they ought to be asking themselves this question, how can I leave this money to my kids in a way that will make them feel good and not in a way where I'm creating a bunch of entitled, shameful trust fund babies who have not earned their keep and who therefore don't feel good about what they're getting, don't appreciate it, don't value it, and don't know how to safeguard it. Yeah, so that's the, that's the concept yes. too, coming from education. And I think all we're doing right now is also education. So this is great. Completely um, is is about giving you you can give someone someone in my case children self esteem, and that's exactly what you're you can't give the children self esteem. They obtain self esteem by accomplishing something. That's right. That's and right. so what the other part you're talking about is for is the inheritance. One thing that you will see when I work with business owners who accumulate a good amount of, of capital is they do not foster the relationship where the, the family is the business. And so that the children are part of actually growing the capital in the business. So then thus, when they are given this big amount, all of a sudden they feel this sense of guilt, like they don't deserve it. They might not know that's what they're feeling, but that's yeah. what they're feeling. That's if it. You, that's the bread of shame. Right. If you can bring them into that, 
process as as the business, you know, and then I hear, well, I don't want to force them in the family business. Well, that, that's not even the point. They don't even have to be in the family business, but they have to be allowed to make that choice and see what it is. And then they actually, actually have to understand that, okay, if you're not going to be in the family business, I do want to still give you this portion of capital, but you have making this, you have made that choice to then do that. And everybody agrees. It's all in, it's all in contract. And now there's no guilt about it. That's right. Because that was part of the family business that, Hey, we're going to give this to you. That's right. That's yeah. right. That really, um, that real really boils down to something our rabbi has taught us, which is happiness is a byproduct of doing the right thing. So it's not like happiness is some external thing that happens to you. You create the happiness when you choose well, when you make good choices, when you're responsible, you feel good. So you create your happiness. It's a byproduct. That is so, so valuable. I think um, it's so interesting as you're talking about the idea of the bread of shame and yeah. the idea of having something unearned. I think that's part of the reason why we've seen the most valuable way to work on giving an inheritance is to do it in the context of somehow they are not just being given this transfer, this one way direct ticket with money, but they're having to earn the gift that you want to give them. Right. And you're partnering the values with the valuables, the, the financial assets that you're providing. So there's just so, so much overlap in this. And I really want to thank you, um, Ruhi, for going down the path of that, that deep thought here about why was the world even created? I think sometimes it can be so easy. I'm sure you have felt this so easy for people to look for quick answers. They want a, a strategy, a tactic, a tool, something that's going to answer a quick question. I'm going to implement this tomorrow and it's going to ultimately just produce this fruit in my life. And sometimes, in fact, I think all the time, the answer is something much deeper at a, a level of the principle of what is always true that needs to be understood fundamentally before you can just apply a strategy or a tactic. Absolutely. And have it work. You know, and that's, that's the concept of Musser truly is that it's a lifelong process because anything that is of value takes time, you know, and this is just as applicable to money, right? I mean, I tell this to my kids, if there's some get rich quick scheme, it's probably a scheme, mm -hmm. right? Because real money takes time to yes. build and grow and invest and earn. And you've got to stay with it and stay responsible, you know, keep producing a quality product, keep producing quality content, you know, and the world will catch up with you. And the same thing is true of our character. There is no quick fix. You can't just, you know, snap your fingers and all of a sudden you're going to have ethical character. It takes years of honing and practicing and messing up and fixing, repairing, apologizing, start again. You know, none of this stuff happens fast and nothing of value happens fast. Food that is prepared slowly tastes better than, I know fast food is delicious, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> There's a whole movement called the slow food movement. I'm sure you are yeah. familiar with that. Yeah. But yes. I love what you're sharing. It, there. It's true. There is no silver bullet. There is no magic. Get anything quick besides the microwave, which I would argue degraded the quality of food and and oh for sure takes away the and the inside is always cold and the outside's too hot. Yes. It's great for a quick fix, but it is not the same. You Absolutely. know, and, and I think that goes back to the character trait of patience, you know, which is everything of value takes patience. Relationship building takes patience. Building a relationship with a higher power takes patience. You know, at the, developing your character takes patience. Uh, earning a sustainable living takes patience. All of it takes patience. And, you know, that's not exactly a fun thing to hear, but it is the truth. So let's take that thought and pivot here. We're getting close to the top of the hour. And I did realize as well, the live did not work. So we'll push this live later. Um, so okay. that's not a problem. Um, but we are in a position of saying, okay, it's important to focus on developing my character. It's important to construct my soul. What 
how do I know if I'm going in the right direction? I guess is the question. If if there's not an end goal, like, well, I know that I reach it when I get to heaven, or I know I reach it when I make a million dollars. I know I reach it when my child says these words back to me. It's not like yeah. a an end goal. It's not something maybe as external. How do you know you're going in the right direction and continuing on that progress? And then um, I'd like to wrap up by talking about your book and how somebody can get that. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things I mentioned in the book, Soul Construction, is about the concept of mentorship in a personal sense. Um, meaning a lot of people in the business world uh, understand about the concept of mentorship, um, you know, cultivating somebody who can walk you through somebody who's ahead of you. So I suggest very much in my book about cultivating a mentor for your personal life, for your ethical, you know, your ethical development, not just, not just a mentor, but perhaps a, a board of directors, so to speak, right? I have a personal collection of people that I reflect to when I need help. I have a friend who's several years older than me, ahead of me in life. I have my mother-in-law is very, very wise, and I consult with her sometimes. We have our rabbi. Um, I have a woman scholar who I, whom I consult with sometimes. And there are times that I don't know. You know, I'll just give you an example. I mentioned that our youngest is 12 years old, and I find my life shifting somewhat. I have more free time than I used to. I, I know that sounds a little crazy because I still have seven kids. <laughs> and two in-law kids <laughs> and two books and a congregation but I do find myself my life has shifted and I have more time and, and I've been thinking to myself am I maximizing my time and so I made a commitment to myself to speak to one of my mentors to to you know kind of flesh that out with her um, and when I'm having an ethical dilemma at work you know, we'll very often speak to a rabbi or I'll speak to my friend because I think that we have to recognize that we're not always objective about ourselves and that we, this, this comes up in my chapter on speech about criticism that sometimes we have to sort of harness critiques from other people. Of course, in a safe and respectful relationship where somebody's going to be honest with us in a way that feels safe, but that, you know, to say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about this. Am I off base here? Am I off course? Help me out. You know, am I being biased? Am I overreacting? And, you know, the muster texts tell us that we should cultivate as friends people who are willing to tell us the truth, not just people who want to tell us what, we, what they think we want to hear. So I think really the only way to stay on course is to include other people whom we deem wise to help us make those, you know, those calls because we can't always see our own stuff clearly and so to at least recognize that there is a bias and to include other people in helping to overcome it mm. very very insightful so can you talk about your book i know we did not get to the full eight principles or the eight keys <laughs> to success well we touched um, on some of them so we sure did so if you want to um just tell where tell why did you write the book what can somebody get by jumping into this book. And if you want, you can go through those eight keys yeah. to success as well. Absolutely. So my book is called Soul Construction. Uh, and it's uh, shape your character using eight steps from the timeless Jewish practice of Musser. The eight character traits, although there's an unlimited number of character traits that a person could focus on. Um, but the eight character traits that I focus on is acceptance. So this is about accepting others for who they are generosity and it's not just about money it's about generosity of spirit forgiveness silence so learning when not to speak which believe it or not is a whole chapter renewal so coming back from our mistakes repairing ourselves happiness which i mentioned speech which i mentioned and favorable judgment so learn, learning to judge others favorably the reason I wrote this book is because this is basically what I've been teaching for the past 20 years. And I very often travel to other cities and communities as a public speaker. And every single time somebody says to me, is this information in a book somewhere? So I needed the answer to that question to be yes. So <laughs> I wrote the book and it's, it's, it's a short book. It's, it's easily readable, but every sentence is sort of very dense. There's a lot to unpack. <clears throat> it draws on ancient Jew Jewish wisdom. There's a ton of sources, but I also include TED Talks, modern psychology, books I've read, memoirs, movies, you know, so I kind of draw from all of that to support this concept. And I, and, and psychology very much plays into Musser as well, because the more we understand human behavior, the more we can improve upon ourselves and others. Uh, um, <clears throat> You know, and as we mentioned, really using this wisdom in everything that we do, <clears throat> because we we believe that spirituality is not just something that takes place in a house of worship or in a holy site. 
but it's something that we take with us wherever we go. You know, a person can't like walk into a house of worship and pray to God and then go into their life and be unethical or dishonest or greedy. That's just not, you know, we're aiming to be holistic human beings. Um, so this book is available on Amazon. It's available in hard copy, Kindle, and audio. So you can get that on Audible. It's um, also available at the publisher's website, so soulconstruction.net. Um, I read the book on Audible, so there's my voice in your brain for five hours. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know. What else do you feel like your listeners might want to know? That's awesome. If somebody was looking for more guidance or a better way to connect with you, tell them how can they find your podcast, your other materials, your blog, uh, okay. and other resources that you provide. Absolutely. So if you Google my name, Rukhi Koval, it's hard to say, but easy to spell. R-U-C-H-I-K-O-V-A-L. <laughs> um, you'll get my blog. It's called Out of the Ortho Box. That's a play on words on the fact that I am orthodox, but I am out of the box, orthodox. So that's my blog. Um, if you go on wherever you find your podcast, Apple, Spotify, or whatever, and look up my name, my podcast will come up. I have two of them. Um, one of them is my weekly class on Musser. It's about a 45-minute class. And one of them is a 10-minute weekly selection on the Torah portion. So it's a little short little 10-minute Bible study. Um, and I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, too. Not so active there like I used to be. Uh, and I also have an app. It's called Ruchi Koval. If you go in your app store, search my name. There it is. Many of my lectures are on there. I do weave a lot of Hebrew uh, into my lectures, but I translate whenever I do so. So that's where you can find me. That's fascinating. Thank you so much for being here today and for just making an effort to help people understand these fundamental principles about being good people. And you would think you're just born good or you're born not good, but that's not really the truth. I think we all have a lot of intentional work that we can do to improve our character one step at a time. And just thank you for all of the, the work that you've done to help somebody really develop in that way. Yeah, it's my pleasure. This was a great conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ruki. So as we close today, go to out of the orthobox.com. You can also go to Ruki Koval. I think I said that correctly um, <laughs> on it to get her app or to um, be able to look her up on any of the social sites, check out the work that she's doing. I am two chapters into your book right now, and I can say it's very dense, it's very deep, and it's very challenging in a beautiful way that really helps somebody to, to look at their own life and say, wow, I never saw things that way before. This is very insightful and helping me to gain that clarity. So thank you for the work that you're yeah. doing. So in closing, please remember, success leaves clues. So model the successful few, not the crowd, and build a life and business you love.